Boost, all aboard. Today, 10 up from 6, the number of perfection is... From the Marseille deck, we're going to hear from Khodorovsky. But first, here is... My God. Here is the Piatnik version of the rather calm-looking falling people. One of them halfway emerging from the tower. And we've got the Rider Waite Smith version as well. Beautiful destruction there. Beautiful regrowth potentials. Showers of electric fire. And I would like to broadly compare this, the very much phallic, cock shaped card of the Major Arcana with our vagina, with the world, and the clitoris at the head. Literally the head of the world, head of the woman, the focal point, the bundle of nerves, the node of pleasure and nerve fibres. Then we have the world as realisation, culmination, fulfilment, orgasm. And we have ejaculation, the male orgasm. So as the counterpart to the female orgasm, we're going to talk about the male orgasm. Um, so uh, let's get straight to it. From Alejandro Jodorowsky's The Way of the Tarot, the spiritual teacher in the cards, number 16, Le Maison Dieu, the tower. Le Maison Dieu, or excuse me, La Maison Dieu, the house god, the house god. In previous versions of the tarot, it was known as the devil's house. Opening the emergence of what was imprisoned. The message of this card is one of great spiritual comfort. However, until the restoration of the Tarot of Marseille, people generally saw the Arcanum 16 as a reference to the Tower of Babel. The most common interpretation spoke of punishment of pride, catastrophe, divorce, castration, earthquake, earthquake and ruin. Oswald Worth, the creator of the Tarot of Medieval Printmakers, imagined a king and queen falling from a tower and added a brick shattering the woman's head. We have no brick shattering a woman's head. We have very little in the way of human expression, at least anything beyond passivity, uh, resignation. There's no calamity in their expressions. And there is, I think, never any expressions at all in terms of extreme dramatic expressions in the tarot, at least in the Marseille tarot. Everyone looks rather impassive, rather detached, expressionless stony, vacant. If you read carefully, if you read carefully the passage from the Bible discussing the Tower of Babel, you will see that its destruction is far from being a catastrophe. Rather than a punishment, the dissolution to a problem. The deluge of Noah, of course, um, has finally ended. The entire planet, abundantly irrigated, has become fertile. But the very few, but very few human beings remain. Instead of dispersing to cultivate the land, they are joining forces to construct a tower that will climb into the heavens and reach God. We really must read uh, the myth, uh, the story of the Tower of Babel, from uh, Genesis. And I'm going to read it in, I, th I think I've got the King James Version here. So I'm going to read from the Bible, uh, from the Genesis account of the Tower of Babel. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they must begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Um, okay, that's just a tiny excerpt of the Tower of Babel. Um, the myth of the Tower of Babel. God destroys the tower. Actually, God doesn't directly destroy the tower. God sees that everyone is capable of climbing up to, to him, uh, to use the Old Testament language, and so creates many different languages. The idea was there was one universal language, and God creates this to stop people 
from getting too big for their boots and putting them in their place. A different account of the Tower of Babel and a very, very helpful one is Saramagal. Saramagal's Cain. And I'm going to read this whole passage. So, the image of casting the dice, Cain, Alia, Jacta, Est. You see the Latin to cast the dice, to throw the dice. Uh, Cain moves, Cain is walking, Cain is moving in this uh, narrative. So, in, according to Saramago, um, Cain uh, approaches Babel, or ancient Babylon. Um, and as he approached, the sound of voices faint at first began growing and growing until it became a hubbub. They seemed like madmen, like complete maniacs, thought Cain. Yes, they were mad, but with desperation because they spoke, uh, but could not understand each other, as if they were deaf and had, had to keep speaking louder and louder and in vain. They were all speaking different languages, and some of them even laughed and made fun of the others, as if their language was more musical and more beautiful than anyone else's. None of these languages had it in the world. So, when we came to the east to settle here, according to one person in this narrative, someone that Cain talks to, we all spoke the same language. That's the assumption, of course. There was one universal language, everyone joined it, and everyone collaborated to reach God. That was the whole point of a tower. So, continuing Saramagal's narrative, and, that was, and what was that language called, asks Cain. Well, since it was the only one, it didn't need a name, replied the other figure. It was just language. So what happened? Well, someone had the idea of making bricks and firing them in a kiln. It's very clear in Genesis that they, of the way that the people, someone had to make fire them in a kiln or an oven. How do you make them? The former shredder of mud, feeling that he was among his own people because they're both speaking Hebrew. Just as we had always done with clay, sand and grit, and for mortar we used mud. And then, when we decided to build a city with a large tower, the one over there, a tower that would reach up to the sky, well, why would you build a tower? Why did you build a tower? So that we would be famous. So God perceived this idea of building a tower to reach God as kind of arrogance. And God doesn't directly destroy the tower. There's nothing in Genesis to say that the tower was destroyed by anyone, but popular folk narrative has kind of solidified this idea that there's a sort of destruction, a hurricane. The problem here is why would God do this? We have to remember, of course, Saramago was a strong atheist, he was a communist as far as I'm aware. So why on earth would God destroy a tower if we're trying to reach our way up to heaven? Um, God. The great fault of God, according to Saramago's narrative, his great fault is jealousy. Instead of being proud of his children, he succumbed to envy, and he obviously can't bear to see anyone happy. All this toil, all this work, and sweat for nothing. What a shame, said Cain. It would have been a fine tower. Yes, said the man, fixing greedy eyes on Cain's donkey. Um, so... I think I'll just do one more little bit. The Lord was carrying out his threat, which was to send a great wind that would not leave uh, stone on stone or brick on brick. Cain was too far away to feel the violence of the hurricane blown from the mouth of the Lord or the roar of the walls topping one after, toppling one after the other. The pillars, the arcades, the vaults, the buttresses. And so the tower appeared to collapse in silence like a house of cards until all that remained was a vast cloud of dust that rose up to the sky and obscured the sun. Many years later, people would say that a meteorite had fallen there, a celestial body of the many that wander around in space. But that isn't true. It was the Tower of Babel, which the Lord, out of pride, would not allow to be completed. The Lord, out of pride, would not allow to be completed. The history of mankind in our, is our history of our misunderstanding with God. For he does not understand us, and we do not understand him. And this is beneath the rubble, I think, of this card, is the constructions we all have of God the fruitless attempts we have of putting God into words and the pathetic pettiness of the Old Testament God that looks at mankind being able to do amazing things and tries to get them to work against each other because he's jealous and he's small-minded and he's not a very pleasant figure at all. Why on earth anyone would see this as a, a valid depiction of God? It, it 
bothers me and it upsets me that this is even accepted as a valid story, the story of the Tower of Babel. Um, the Tower is an allegory, uh, at least in the Bible, uh, an allegory of the humbling of people. The people are being put to the ground quite literally. Humble, humble, the word humble, humility, both come from the word humus, meaning ground, to be put to the ground. The first step, I believe, of therapy would be that the uh, person, the client, needs to understand that they are only human and just human and have faults. They have a problem that they need to deal with. If you don't think you have a problem or you don't think you have some kind of trauma or some issue, then how are you ever going to love yourself or move on? But it's a violent step. Hung, some aspects of humbling require certain lightning strikes, certain thunder. So this divine penetration, this phallic penetration potentially is, is necessary, a kind of divine ejaculation, you could say. Um, so why does God feel the need in this quite mental, quite crazy narrative, why does God need to uh, assert his power so unnecessarily? This to me is a bit of a, 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 a strange question, a strange situation in the Old Testament, far from the much wiser, more mature approach uh, of Taoism, which uh, talks a lot about leadership. What is it to be a leader? What is it to, to be humble as well? A good leader, according to uh, Lao Tzu, is someone who doesn't want to be leader. Precisely the person who doesn't desire being leader should be leader for that very purpose. So God is, in the Old Testament, is precisely the person who shouldn't be a leader. And in a way, the God is kind of recycled and destroyed over and over again. In Milton's Paradise Lost, um, there's a suggestion that God goes through an endless recycling of different facets and characteristics and refuses to seek some kind of solution until the real deep difference and penetration of the God of the New Testament, this new uh, Old Testament God 2.0. Uh, there's wonderful painting by Bruegel uh, of the Tower of Babel, um, uh, and this is said to reflect the fears of Protestants and death Rome to be the eternal sea. And of course, it was ransacked by barbarians from uh, present day Germany. Um, there was a fear uh, of languages, of course coming around at that time. A Bruegel was painting at the beginning of the Renaissance, uh, beginning of, I believe, the Protestant revolutions, 1520s, 1530s, where the Bible was being translated into many different local languages. So there was clutter, this noise, this hubbub of languages becomes its own kind of babble, its own kind of fear of this estrangement from God. Second crazy thing about this narrative of the Tower of Babel can you imagine a world where we all spoke the same language? It sounds harmonious and peaceful for about two seconds. This Esperanto wish, to me, is the most boring kind of utopian idealism. It would be fantastically dull to live in a place where people only spoke one language. One of the, the crowning features of this wonderful project of the EU is to encourage local languages to see all those translators in the European Parliament converting from Estonian to uh, Hungarian and from Welsh to Italian. That project is of, of celebration of diversity in the sense of it is actually difference that makes it worthwhile to interact. A pluralism is not as problematic as it seems because we have that difference. Difference is, of course, something to be celebrated and the irony of the tower of babel story is of course that it's a story that tries to explain something it tries to explain why we have so many different languages it posits the idea that we all had one language in the first place which of course isn't really helpful and true instead of trying to clear things up it makes things eternally more uh, uh complicated it, it gets wound up in its own linguistic kind of labyrinth instead of missing the spirit the spirit of the of the of the 
um, the endeavour of men to build closer to God, to build together. One Talmudic explan explanation of the Tower of Babel, well, the Talmud is a sort of series of interpretations of the Bible, of the Old Testament. The Talmud uh, says that actually, well, God only destroyed the tower because they, uh, the men working on the tower didn't see another man fall. And it was man's disregard for man that made God implant so many different languages. Nice way to think about it. Uh, many myths of towers being destroyed can be found across the world. Uh, parallel stories in Mexico, Nepal, Botswana, uh, among others. Um, so uh, Babylon as well was a uh, highly developed um, part of the world uh, in, in such times in, in antiquity. And maybe this is internal fear of humans sort of, of advancement. So Hodorowsky, uh, I can't see how to arm on him here, but Hodorowsky believes that the Tower of Babel is a, tower, is, a, is a story of hope for humankind. Instead of dispersing to cultivate land, they are joining forces to construct a tower that will climb into the heavens and reach God. In principle, this construction is intended as an act of love, a desire to know the kingdom of the Creator. Now the creator, knowing this plan cannot be realized, does not strike the tower with lightning, nor does he cause any of its inhabitants to fall from it. He merely creates the diversity of languages to separate them. This is a blessing more than a punishment. Humanity starts off again to conquer the world and start tilling the fields. I disagree. The Old Testament God who's purported to have done this uh, is the premature, premature ejaculator, fearful, working through anxiety and spilling out before the time was right. Why do men have problems with premature ejaculation? There's a huge circle um, uh, of, of reasons and potential ideas. Uh, and one of the sort of classic things that comes up is anxiety. Uh, performance anxiety particularly um, this uh, sort of um, hypersensitivity potentially as well but let's let's be honest premature ejaculation huge common problem among many many men obviously not to be solved with pharmaceuticals that's explaining the idea away that's kind of a, making a terrible narrative or and simplifying things at least Hodorowsky goes tries to go a little bit deeper Key words to the tower, temple, construction, joy, overflowing, shock, expression, celebration, dancing, to uncork, opening, moving house, interesting one, moving house, and exploding. In the different versions of the tarot, the tower has no door. This is a really peculiar thing about this card. The door. There seems to be two problems of perspective. Now, if you're looking for perfection in the tarot, you're looking in the wrong place, at least in terms of its design. There's so much imperfection going on in the tarot, which is part of its uh, rugged sacredness, in my opinion. There's wonderful disjunctures and edges and worn out images that I think add to its charm. But there are two things, strange things kind of going on. At the bottom, the man emerging from the door, it looks like, uh, we're not looking for perspective. This is pre sort of um, perspective uh, art, to put it in that way. Uh, but w the, the man emerging from the green door, it just doesn't look right. Second of all, now I'm being really pedantic here. I want you to look at the three windows or arches, those three blue windows. Look how the bottom two have a full semicircle or horseshoe and the one above only has one sort of edge exposed. And on the other side, there is no lighter blue. It doesn't fall into place. It's almost as if, like in a cubist sense, we have two perspectives within this card. In the different versions of the tarot, the tower has no door. The restoration work not only allows us allowed us to find the tower's door again, but also the three initiatory steps leading to it. In ancient alchemical engravings and Masonic documents, we also see this tower equipped with a door and these steps leading up to it, sometimes as many as seven and sometimes three. Let's not forget why the, na the Masons are called the Masons. They are supposed to be, oops, that's the world. Um, the Masons were supposed to be inheritors of the old Mas uh, Masonic or the old builders guild the old secret knowledge of how to build the pyramids so there's a secret of esotericism within the within architecture architecture itself 
The initiate must first accept the new knowledge, the symbol of the divine creation, and then know how to preserve it. And then thirdly, how to let go of it. Interesting. How to let go of it. When should humans know their place and not exceed their uh, capabilities? This is the moment when the green door, the symbol of eternity, decorated with a moon emblematic of total receptivity, will open and reveal the interior of the tower. This tower has sometimes been compared to the alchemical Athenor, the oven in which the primal matter becomes the philosopher's stone. For me, it, it, it's slightly related to this. The tower represents human endeavor. The tower also represents our constructions of God and why they need to be destroyed at certain moments. Also, what's curious is the electricity in this card, the almost like electric shower we can see to the sides of the tower and the strangely expressionless um, pictures of the face or the the the, the uh, stony vacant glazed uh, eyes of the people falling down as if they're sort of glad to be ejected ejaculated from the uh, tower ejaculate ejaculate means jacere jacere uh, means to to throw and e ejaculate just means an extreme throw like beyond throwing the tower la maison dieu is not the house of god it is the house god house slash god the tarot indicates quite clearly with the flesh colored bricks that this tower is our body and that our body contains the deity the half open door allows a yellow light to escape the body is filled with the light of consciousness. The figures are not in the middle of falling, quite the contrary. Their hair is yellow, the colour of illumination, and they are touching the plants growing out of the ground with their hands. In reality, they are honouring the potential of the earth. They have their heads at the bottom like the hanged man of Arcanum 7, because they are seeing the world in a new way. The intellect, the mind, is looking directly at nature. One of the feet of the figures is pointed towards the sky. His steps are leading him to the mind. You, are ha you have a problem. You don't know what the problem is. You are nervous and anxious. The problem finds a resolution. It has a conflict. The conflict is important before the resolution. So you are happy and rejoicing because you have the um, conflict there. Without the conflict, you don't have any leadings to resolution. So that, to me, explains possibly the expressionless glazed um, faces. The idea idea that it's much better to be locked in a tower with the problem than to know that you're at least uh, moving uh, excuse me it's it's worse to be locked in with the problem it's better to be falling into something else in something new uh, and have at least some kind of confirmation that there is movement a bigger metaphor for this is for me about depression depression isn't necessarily sadness depression is lack of feeling numbness ennui uh, existential boredom uh, lack of interest in the world, lack of involvement in the world. Interest means to be inside, interesse. So depression is not misery or sadness necessarily. In fact, sadness can have its, of course, its own sweetness. At least with sadness, you know in a way where you stand with something and you're not in this kind of existential uh, nomadic land, uh, so to speak. So... The two imps of Arcanum 15, which is the, uh, of course, the devil, have become humanized and realized their ascent. Do I have the devil somewhere around? Uh, so we remember from the devil, we have these imps, these characters here. Look at the parallel from the card following uh, the, the imps, this more evolved, potentially evolved uh, human characters. There's an awful lot of triads going on in the tarot. We can see three of the triangle in both of these cards. The two imps of Arcanum 15, or the devil, have become humanized and have realized their ascent. The yellow patches on the ground could be interpreted as an offering to the temple to gold nuggets. Brings to mind also the very male desire to make totems, uh, to make cenotaphs. Um, there's a, f a symbol of the, I can't quite remember, the obelisk. Uh, the obelisk is a symbol of the enlightenment. It's pointed, it's straight, it's very phallic, of course, unconsciously representing male power or desire, male power to dominate. It's also the first thing to hit the, the rays of the sun. The figure of the enlightenment is human beings, us men, we are capable of being inspired by God's light or being enlightened 
in the phallic sense, not, 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 not in the receptive sense, not the idea of embodying knowledge or being penetrated by knowledge. In instead, men are the penetrators and we pierce the world of knowledge as we have with our injections and our um, in inoculations and our microscopes. We see things anatomized, divided, decomposed, instead of part of a greater cosmic whole. There's an argument for both of them, and we're going to be leading towards this idea of non-duality, which is really well outlined in um, the Vedic or Vedic texts of India and um, Tibet. I was going to say Tunisia. <laughs> The yellow patches on the ground could be interpreted as, as an offering to the temple, two gold nuggets. The two figures have climbed from the cavern of the subconscious to honour the earth with their offerings and aid nature. They bring consciousness into the world by impregnating the terrain, impregnating ejaculation. You can see, of course, fluid of some form or another from the skies raining down. They bring consciousness into the hour, into the world by impregnating the terrain. Through their action, the landscape is coloured light blue, orange and dark green. The lightning-like entity either emerging from or penetrating into the tower. I've done it again. That's the world. There's the devil. Here's the tower. The flame, the firebird or lightning flash is united with the crown of creation. We do not know from where it comes or where it is going as the pneuma or the spirit of the gospel of saint john but that doesn't matter we know it's there god is there somehow is it coming from the tower is it going to the tower who knows it's a mystery so this is not the destruction but the transformation of material power into spiritual fulguration the diabolic androgynous being of arcanum 15 or the devil has become a flame that has climbed up to the entire spinal column and opened the coronary nervous center to launch itself into the cosmos let's not forget the theme of electricity this entity bears all the colors of the earth yellow red green flesh this is an assumption. We can distinguish a flesh-coloured fetal shape that symbolises the seed of a new consciousness, the human race's contribution to the development of the universe. The creation of a new being is announced, one that will take on material form in the star. The ground, enriched with colours, unites with the figures emerging from the tower in the same way that the flame joins with the crown. So you can think of electric rain, electric flame as well, the com combination of electricity into water and into flame and the other way around as well the flow of divine contact flow is going to be a bit of a theme theme as well sixth degree like the lover the tower evokes the themes of union here if we wish to accept the homophony of the original french the union of the soul and its god so uh, there's Hodorowsky likes a bit of a pun and a bit of wordplay and of course this was originally written in French and there's a footnote here um, the soul and its god in French is l'âme son dieu l'âme son dieu or l'âme son dieu I've said that quite badly but it sounds like la maison dieu the house god so it's the French name for this arcanum so basically house god in french sounds a lot like the soul and its god um there's a lot of uh, twinning of the body and uh, and god in in uh, the bible um my father's house has many rooms for example in the new testament the union of the soul and its god this alliance produces colored drops like concentrated bits of energy um uh, the Hasidic tales uh, have a lot to do with overflow of God's love. Hasidism is a, I think, a 16th century, century uh, Jewish uh, group from central, present-day Central Europe who were ecstatic in their love for God. Uh, I found them very attractive because they were sort of very unrestrained. They were a bit like Walt Whitman, just overflowing with love, this electric energy and uh, this ecstasy for God's engagement. And there's a wonderful story about um, 
uh, a, a man going to rabbi saying, um, asking him about the mystery of teaching, where he gets his inspiration and why he teaches. And why can't you teach me now? Why can't you tell me now a story? Or why can't you give me instruction right now? And the rabbis in Hasidism are very sort of reluctant to sort of follow directly what they are being told. He says, I'm, I teach when I teach. I teach when I'm inspired as the barrel overflows. So there's this idea that love is a, a, an ejaculation, premature or otherwise, a kind of un, uh, an unwanted or uncommanded ejaculation. It's simply flowing through. Um, the second thing is it's not you, you to decide when you ejaculate, <laughs> when you um, give this teaching to people. Keep in mind the idea of teaching has strong ties with with sowing fields uh, and insemination. After all, the uh, monks live in seminaries in their beginning stages. Semen, seminaries, it all comes to the word seed. Um, as the barrel overflows. Also, it's not up to the followers of the rabbi to decide when they get taught, it's up to the rabbi. Second story from Hasidism is, uh, the Hasidic tales is uh, about when is it right to give counsel? When is it right for the rabbi to help uh, people? And a rabbi responds to a request for help by saying, I can't help you now. I have to hear you. And to hear you means to scratch your words into my heart, which I then sing to God. Inscribing and penetration is also a real big part of the idea of therapy. Uh, confession, Freudian psychoanalysis, and of course consulting with your rabbi. This combination of penetration, oh, penetration and reception, knowing when to receive, knowing when to penetrate. So in a sense that mystical ideals, in a sense, is being so receptive that you will gush and overflow with God's love, not on your timetable, but on a different timetable. You are receptive enough to splurge, <laughs> to gush. Um, so, what I find difficult about this card is relationship with beauty. Uh, six is the, uh, um, the number of beauty and, and pleasure, particularly pleasure. I can understand how this could be connected with, like how, uh, the world is connected with orgasm and realization and culmination. This may be instead something like judgment, uh, judgment number 20, uh, the medieval idea of enjoying jo God's judgment and knowing your place and having confirmation. This in a sense is like the bursting through the, uh, the incision into you of some kind of inspiration that is welcome and wanted. This alliance produces the colour drops like concentrated bits of energy. Here's the really wonderful bit, which really fascinates me. In sacred Indian texts, in the Vedic texts, it is said that knowledge is like milk, which, when beaten, eventually re releases drops of oil on the surface. Milk, semen, uh, the, the creaminess, the maternal liquid, and ejaculate so many similarities oiliness warmth but nourishment um, there's a really wonderful poem i took from a book which i've listed in the description um, uh, the book is called masters of mahamudra songs and histories of the 84 buddhist siddhas so uh, i'm really quite new to this whole world but this is from Tantric philosophy, um, or Tantric uh, th theology, um, and it's very much related to what knowledge is. Biblical knowledge, of course, is making love, and knowledge is also represented in Tantric texts uh, as Vajra. Vajra is a divine object. It's a kind of little mini diamond sword, as far as I'm aware. It symbolizes knowledge uh, in a way that it's a diamond, it's indestructible, and it's a thunderbolt at the same time, which is the irresistible force. Irresistible, penetration, enjoyment. Also irresistible in that it cannot be stopped if you're open to it. Electric rain 
of ontological pleasure, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to read this poem, or most of it, and uh, unless I'm mistaken, I think it's by a priest, a Vedic or Vedic priest called Dengipa, Dengipa, D-E-N-G-I-P-A. It's talking about cooking, it's talking about rice and the process of grinding, grinding grains and spices. So he's talking about the rice thresher as well, beating and sifting the rice. I thresh rice in the pestle as my yoga. Yoga, yoking, joining. Yoga means to join, it means union. I sweep together the scattered grains and thresh it with the guru's precepts, threshing, shaking, turning over ideas, thinking of all possibilities, intellectual engagement. Ignoring other people's work, I beat the black grain pure. I beat out sin with virtue first, threshing with the pestle of Vajra knowledge. Vajra is that uh, thunderbolt dagger uh, of knowledge, the diamond of knowledge. And the grains of rice are the sun and the moon. So knowledge is, the, 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 the production of knowledge is cosmic is the grains of rice are the sun and the moon. In the essential empty nature of the mortar, the mortar is the thing you use to bash things, very, of course, phallic or tower-like uh, uh, symbol or dagger-like symbol. I beat giving and taking to a unity. So it uses this tower-shaped <laughs> um, instrument very much in the way that the tarot represents um, uh, knowledge, intellectual engagement as a sword, cold, uh, made by men, made by humankind, and of course very phallic. When thought like milk, and this is why we're coming back to Khodorovsky, when thought like milk is churned by the mantra hum or om, om, pure pleasure congeals as fine butter, and that is the taste of of non-duality. When I'm a little bit upset or down or struggling with this isolation, <laughs> it's now two weeks of uh, <laughs> my uh, self-quarantine, I get a little bit uh, sensitive. Um, I talk to friends and they say, oh, well done for doing these readings. You seem like you have something to prove or uh, you, th you feel like you have something important to say. And I only hear the negative, which is, no, I don't. I don't like the sound of my own voice. I just want routine. I just want to do something. And I, I get in a mood. And I really want to emphasize that I'm doing this through joy, through love, and not through trying to make a point or seem clever or intellectual. My whole spiritual progress was l learning to unlearn or reading enough so I forget words to be led through joy. It's really easy when you're in a routine, kind of strict routine of meditation to bash yourself on the back and see this ideal of suffering. I don't dig it at all. I really believe that all of this can be really exquisite and good fun to the extent of being intellectually penetrated, that these intellectual engagements have a bodily resonance as well, that they can be so fun and engaging as to have a very strong sexual component of penetration and reception. Threshing with the pestle of Vajra knowledge, the grains of rice are the sun and the moon. In the essential empty nature of the mortar, is the duality coming, I beat giving and taking to a unity. I bring it all together in a mulch, in a mush. It all mixes together. When thought, like milk, is churned by the mantra om or hum, pure pleasure congeals as fine butter. And that is the state of non-duality. By using meditation, by using the incantation, using your voice to congeal everything, or everything is brought together by the process of making the word flesh. Using words to lose words. The wholeness and the emptiness together in one non-dual mess or mix, like the sperm or the milk that is churned into an oily goodness. A quick reading a uh, quick thing about um, Vajrayana. Vajrayana is a kind of Buddhism which um, stems from this idea of knowledge as a sword, a diamond sword. Vajrayana comes from Vajra, Vajra, the sword. 
uh, just quickly read an outline of this sort of tantric view of the world. In the tantric view, enlightenment arises from the realization that seemingly opposite principles are in truth one. The passive concepts shunyata, emptiness, and prana, or prana, wisdom, for example, must be resolved with the active karu excuse me, karuna and upaya, which is compassion and skillful means. So emptiness and wisdom has to uh, sort of mix together like a pestle and mortar with compassion and skill. This fundamental polarity and its resolution are often expressed through symbols of sexuality, which is why if you type in tantric in Google, you'll just get entries for sex. But it's much more than this, although <laughs> gender unity is perhaps a really good symbol of this spiritual un un unity. Uh, in Vajrayana Buddhism, it's the mandalas, those beautiful, swirling, congealing, <laughs> psychedelic um, symbols uh, and pictures that sort of represent all of this. And it, for me, it has a bit of a link with the ecstatic art of Islamic prayer rugs. So there you go. Um, Mulad Mahamudra has a certain... Um, openness to so many contradictions a certain, uh, uh, it opens the door to paradox we talked about objet petit a the term of Lacan, Lacan which or Lacan which tries to encompass the impossible um, it's a non-binary that's represented in one word um, and sort of only makes sense after a certain process of meditation or according to Vajrayana Buddhism this om this this uh, process of making the word flesh, the emptiness that is the essence of pure realized wisdom. But there's humbling involved. We don't, we don't want to get too close to God, otherwise this happens. So let's try and find my feet back on earth. So how did we get to Vajrayana Buddhism? It was milk, it was the Ind Indian Vedic texts this combination of Hinduism and Buddhism. In sacred Indian text, it is said that knowledge like milk, which when beaten, eventually releases drops of oil on the surface. It's the oil that nourishes. Similarly, these yellow, red and blue balls floating in the air express the dance of cosmic joy. The dance of cosmic joy. As if to say the stars are our and are bringing us their energy while awaiting our awakening. This cosmic explosion could represent drawings of existing constellations, just like the tower has, through its illumination, a kinship with the lighthouse. These constellation drawings would then be, if you like, a navigational tool. It is the crisis that gives us our uh, possibilities, our direction, our orientation. Again, Hodorowsky will refer to this in the case of reading, when the querent will come to the tarot reader and they will engage and gives us advice, warnings as well. In a reading, the tower signifies the emergence of something that was imprisoned. This can be a residential move, a separation, a moment of great expression, the desire to leave for the country or for another country, or a secret revealed, or even a lightning strike that causes a catastrophe. So it refers, as we have seen, to a dance of joyous separation. The figures are usually acrobats flying about in, in a theatre. This can be giving birth to something that has long been gestating and taking dual shape here. The twinship of the animus and the anima, which is Carl Jung's uh, words for basically male and female spirits, put very simply, animus and anima, collaborating on a long thought out work. Sometimes if a person is seeing only one aspect of his question when interrogating the tarot, the tower reveals the ex existence of a second aspect, a second less obvious possibility represented by the figure that has half emerged from the tower, this peculiar figure at the bottom. The phallic connotation of the tower also makes it a symbol of the male sex organ and all the questions connected to ejaculation. 
When it takes on a more painful meaning of abrupt separation or expulsion, the tower can refer to an expropriation, a rupture, a difficult birth, or in the case of siblings, when one child was wanted, the figure that has emerged entirely, and the other was not, the figure that has only half emerged, like the second child or the middle class syndrome, the abandonment complex. We can also refer a we could also read a reference in this card to a large telluric movement. I think telluric means of the earth, uh, of 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 uh, geology, an earthquake or other natural catastrophe. The, the ground beneath you is shaking. The principal message of the tower could be: stop looking for God in the sky. Let's find him here on earth. Um. Hodorowski mentions Jung. Jung has a peculiar reading of this. Um, uh, he believes it's about the presumption of man, the directionless of man reaching too high. Uh, the longing for the moth, as he writes, uh, the longing of the moth for the star is not absolutely pure and transparent, but glows in sultry mist, for man continues to be man through the excess of his longings, and he draws down the divine into the corruption of his passion. The passion for God can also be corrupt with um, um, inadvertent desires. So raising yourself to God has to be considered from a, a strong f foundation, I guess. I guess that's what Jung is, is trying to say. It's quite pro problematic, I think. Um, so here we go with how the tower speaks. And if the tower spoke, I am the temple, the entire world is an altar I make sacred. My life, like yours, proves at every heartbeat that the world is divine, that the flesh is a living celebration and life a never-ending construction. With me you will know the joy that is the key to the sacred. I am life itself, the transformation and the res re reconstruction, the flame and the energy of everything alive, of all matter and all spirit. If you wish to enter me, you must rejoice cast into the fire the infantile whims and sorrow and fear and ask yourself every time you awake what shall i celebrate now i am the cataclysmic joy of living and the cataclysmic joy of living the permanently unforeseen and marvelous catastrophe the joissance we talked about yesterday joissance being a french word for a pleasure that was almost painful um yes i'll keep going among the traditional interpretations, so here's the whole long list of words. Liberation, opening, to uncork, that's a nice one, to uncork. How are you going to get to the wine, to the nectar, if you're not ready to uncork, to give birth or to let birth happen? Rupture, moving house, house, <laughs> lightning strike, revealed secret, explosion of joy. Prosperity, theatrical decor, theatrical decor, I, I struggle with that one, uh, ejaculations, sometimes premature, deconstruction, or excuse me, destruction, divorce, dispute, castration, God feels undermined, he creates all the languages and therefore creates a, a steady confusion, divide and roll, and therefore it's the castration <laughs> complex of the Old Testament God himself. Explosion of sexual energy. Dance, the body as divine temple. The body is my temple. Great burst of energy. Revelation, assumption meaning ascendance, breaking boundaries, illumination. A defensive crown once isolated me from the world. A cork of old words covered my mind and clouds of crystallized, mummified, sclerotic feelings cast a shadow over my heartbeats and prevented the light from emerging. A thick cloak of desires transformed my appetite for life into a jailer. I was flesh without God. Consuming itself in the flames of its own existence, my ego converted into a prison. 
Despising myself, isolating myself, believing I was defending an inner territory belonging only to me, who was I in the darkness of this tower? Master of what? Scott feels castrated. What was my appearance? What false identity? I was nothing but the rarefied air of an egotistical obscurity. And suddenly, from both inside and outside, a nameless force emerged. The love that sustains all matter. The possibility of men, men being penetrated by God's love. The openness to being incised by divine inspiration. My top opened as well as my inmost depths. The combined energies of heaven and matter cross through me like a hurricane. There is no origin to divine inspiration in the sense that we don't know where it comes from. We don't know where it's going. Where is the fire coming from? From the tower or from the skies? It's not clear. All we know is there's a great flash, a great flow coming at such a hugely quick rate. I knew the bursting of this, excuse me, I knew the burning of the centre of the earth, the light from the centre of the universe. I received the vibrating universal axis. I was no longer a tower, but a channel, like um, an aerial. Then the joy of union burst forth. The high was low, the low was high. This is a great uh, reference to hermetic, the hermetic ideal or the sort of Christian esoteric ideal of as above, so below. Everything has a cosmic and sort of temporal uh, balance or terrestrial balance. So earth balances with above, as above, so below. The joy of union. Yoga means union because it means to yoke, to tie in together like two cows together uh, with a harness. The high was low and the low was high. Like a queen bee, I began to engender joyful beings. God was in me and I was only worshipful matter. I knew that I could burst, that each of my bricks would travel through infinity like a bird. I knew that everything imprisoned in matter gushed through me. Gushed. I was the central pillar of a cosmic dance. I was quite simply the human body in full reception of its original energy. I was quite simply the human body in full reception of its original energy. The idea of going back to the physical, reclaiming the body and feeling even more cosmic vibrations because of it. Big conflict for me is the Judeo-Christian ideals or ideas, I should say and so-called Eastern ideas. Lao Tzu of the Taoist tradition uh, is supposed to have written, if lightning is the anger of the gods, then the gods are concerned mostly about trees. He wasn't referencing maybe Judaism there. In fact, I think he, he couldn't have known exactly what was going on in the Jewish tradition. But he says, if lightning is the anger of gods, then the gods are concerned mostly about trees. I think the tower might have some unconscious things that are represented in terms of the inane, stupid ideas we have of God. The constructions we make that, are so, that miss the mark so much that they need to be dealt with a hammer. The philosophy of a hammer, as Nietzsche put it. It's an, a feeble approach to God this kind of poverty of ideas that needs to be smacked down. So I did that. Peace is not something you attain through peacefulness. Peacefulness, as it's traditionally understood, we don't just go around the world being nice and liberal. In fact, sometimes it's necessary to be polemical, to attack in order to find further peace. And that might involve burning, like the, medi the, the alchemical idea of using an athanor, the, the oven of the alchemical process, the tower could be that. But for me, the pillars of human understanding of divinity is what the tower could represent. Freud wrote um, really wonderfully about religion. They are illusions or religious teachings. Religious teachings are illusions. 
according to Freud, fulfillments of the oldest, strongest and most urgent wishes of mankind. The secret of their strength lies in the, se in the strength of the wishes. It's the wishes that drive myth making of religious teaching. So Freud isn't concerned necessarily with the appearance of God as it manifests in culture. He's curious about the wish fulfillment in the beginning for religious teaching to solve all the riddles of humanity, which is done so pitifully badly in this part of Genesis with the Tower of Babel, in my opinion. But Freud has time for them. Freud has time for these traditions. He says, an illusion is not the same thing as an error. He believes science rules the day. He believes science is the one that will manifest truth much more than the religious explorations or theological explorations. So, what is characteristic, according to Freud, of illusions is that they are derived from human wishes. We constructed this tower, God didn't. In this respect, they come near to psychiatric delusions. So religious teaching is like a psychiatric delusions, but they are different because in the case of delusions, we empathize or emphasize as essential their being in contradiction with reality. So, but illusions don't quite get there with reality. Illusions need not necessarily be false. That is to say, unrealizable or in contradiction to reality. For instance, a middle class girl may have the illusion that a prince will come and marry her. This is actually possible, and such few cases have been observed or have occurred. That the Messiah will come and found a golden age is much less likely. So he thinks that's much more of a delusion potentially. Thus, we call a belief an illusion when a wish fulfillment is a prominent factor in its motivation. And in doing so, we disregard its relations to reality, just as the illusion itself sets no store by verification. Faith comes in here, a cosmic trust rather than a desire for evidence. Of the reality value of most of them, we cannot judge, Freud continues, just as they cannot be proved, so they cannot be refuted. So they cannot be proved, they cannot be refuted. Popper's, Karl Popper's idea of what religion is, uh, excuse me, what science is, is that, is that it's falsifiable. Religious teachings, uh, myths, conspiracy theories, uh, potentially, um, uh, fables, su uh, superstitions, they are not falsifiable. You can't say if they're true or not. The riddles of the universe reveal themselves only slowly to our investigation. There are m many questions to which science today can give no answer, but scientific work is the only road which can lead us to knowledge of reality outside ourselves. It is once again merely an illusion to expect anything from intuition and introspection. They can give us nothing but particulars about ourselves. I dream of a landscape full of towers and any of those towers can be destroyed. We use an instrumental approach to mapping out spirituality and when those towers no longer become useful, so comes the lightning and so becomes the rebuilding. But we will always build towers. Man cannot bear much reality, according to T.S. Eliot. So the destruction of our preconceived notions is to be celebrated. That's a strange thing because the, the face, facial expressions suggest that this passivity is actually something that is a reception, a receiving of God's pleasure. Um, like the reed in Taoist ideas, uh, Taoist philosophy, the reed is something that receives the wind. If it was strong, so-called strong, and it would break. Mental strength is often confused uh, a confused concept. Um, fortitude is being open to fragility or being open with your fragilities, being able to speak about your complexes. So, as lightning that lighteneth, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. From Luke's Gospel, Jesus himself was seen to be a bolt of bolt from the blue, lightning in itself. And that's not always an easy thing. If you discover so much truth in one thing, it means you have to abandon other things as well. So it's not a peaceful process. Um, Jakob Burma, who's a German uh, 
sort of a like a renaissance philosopher and scientist so he went into alchemy he's one of those interesting men who had one foot in spirituality and the other in science he said in order to reach god man has to go through hell first recalling the winston churchill quote if you're going through hell keep going there's also famous quote one of the most famous quotes of nature what does not destroy me makes me stronger the important thing is not to be destroyed not to be destroyed by being supple to the vibrations to put that quote in context it comes from maxims and arrows which is a chapter in twilight of the idols so by nature maxims and arrows being short little lightning bolts of wisdom that's supposed to penetrate in fact, Twilight of the Idols is known as the, the science of the hammer or the philosophy of the hammer penetrating, hitting to, or in order to construct something new. And to quote the full passage, what doesn't kill me only makes me stronger. What is man merely a mistake of God's? So where are we in relation to God's creation here in this picture? Where do you see yourself? Are you in the tower? Are you the tower? Are you the person falling down? Are you the earth? Are you the electric rain? What is man? What is man? Is man merely a mistake of God's? Nietzsche continues, or God merely a mistake of man's? Out of life's school of war, what does not destroy me makes me stronger. Out of life's school of war. I get really uncomfortable with my fellow Quakers who avoid any form of of violent language as if that will somehow dispel any potential of violence in fact i've seen in quaker speech some very violent and aggressive or passive aggressive behavior the world is a struggle the world is a fight why would we abandon a whole vocabulary just because it sounds uncomfortable to us out of life's school of war what does not kill me makes me stronger what we get after the divine jealousy of the Tower of Babel story, we get fraternity. We get two people working eventually together. We get collaboration. We have to reject this stupid idea of God and work together and celebrate the difference of our different languages. So conflict is a way of actually coming together. I've always found the differences in my friends to be much more interesting and comforting in a sense than our similarities. Of course, it's nice to share the same view on the world, but the fact that we're different excites me. The fact that I'm told about new things. I'm not looking for a soulmate in the sense of looking for someone who agrees with everything I think. So the principle of brotherly love, I think, will tie this in together, will yoke things together, will fasten to truth the duality comes together yoke yoga of course the ideal of union 